Hi guys, welcome to Learning Electronics Repair. I have a power supply here that we looked at previously. It's not in the connect box actually, but this is the one. So we'll just get it back out of the box. It's a bit stuck. Oh. Okay, a little bit stuck there. And we have the various bits of it. So this is how we left it after the last time we looked at this. This is a uh, Xylence. Uh, it's a 700 watt with active PFC. And it's quite a handy ATX power supply to be quite honest. So the previous problem we found with this, now we'll link the first video, is that the main output devices, the two transistors, were short circuit we had a look around here so this is basically where the two transistors fit the output devices for the main power supply this one on the same heat sink this is for the standby okay i removed the two large capacitors not that i think there's anything wrong with them just because i need to get to the two devices on here to unscrew them make it easier to take the heat sink off so that's why they've been removed. I then started to look for reasons why the two output transistors were short circuit. And I thought there may be a low resistance or near short on the output. So this heat sink was also desoldered. These are the rectifier diodes. So this is the low voltage side. And this is where the heat sink fitted. So these are the rectifier diodes. I took this off, found there isn't any short circuits on here. But we do have a low value resistor there, which is why I was seeing a low resistance on one of the outputs. This is really just to make sure it has a little bit of load all of the time, which helps the voltage regulation. The other thing we've already done with this is we've replaced the two of the output capacitors they were bulged, so they've been replaced. And all the other ones, all these yellow ones, physically look okay. So that's what we have, yeah. This is the PFC, so this has active power factor correction, PFC. We've had a look at this, can't see any shorts, it all looks okay. So I think that is all right. And I couldn't come up with any particularly good reason why we had short circuit output devices. So, we left the last video, I just needed the parts, I needed these transistors. And they're here, okay, so from AliExpress, these are the ones. I actually have 10 of them, I have two bags full of these. So these are... Uh, if you can read it, just focus it, yeah. 2SC3320. We have a pair of those. So what I'm going to do today first is to fit these, put this all back together, and then let's see if it actually works now. If it doesn't, then we can investigate further. The first thing I'll do then, and these are from AliExpress, by the way. These are, I think, the actual faulty ones, yeah. So you can see a bad one there and a good one there, they look similar, I wouldn't say they look the same, different style package if you like, the printing on it here. Uh. So the first thing I will do is to test whether these are actually okay on the component analyzer. Uh, do they read okay, let's have a look. Okay, and here's one of the transistors. And it reads like an MPN transistor, okay? Blue on the base, which is what you'd expect. Collector in the middle, which is what you'd expect. So that looks okay. Just try another one. But this is no real way to tell if these transistors are correct, like voltage rated and such like. But in my experience, these things don't get faked. There's no reason to make fake transistors like this because they're not valuable. They're probably easily available. There's lots of stocks of them around. So I don't really see any reason why 
I would expect these to be fake transistors. So let's put this back together with these parts and let's see if it works. First of all then, I'll fit the rectifier diodes back on with the heatsink. This only goes one way round anyway because of the spacing of the legs on here. So you can't put it on back to front, otherwise I would just refer to the other video. It's always worthwhile if you're not making videos, guys, to take photos, yeah? So I'll just get this back into place, which might be a little bit fiddly, and then we can solder it. This is proving quite tricky, actually, to get it to line up. So I'm going to use the uh, torch. And put a torch underneath this. And then I can shine the light through the holes, and it makes it a lot easier when I get this to figure out what might need bending slightly to get it to line up with the holes. This is proving quite tricky, guys, actually. I could try removing these two large inductors so I can see what's happening here. It's this end that I'm having trouble to get line up. The other device is okay. But if I do remove these, I suspect I'll have the same problem fitting these back on. But if I remove this capacitor, I can probably see down here then with the torch and figure out what I need to do to line it up. So I'm going to take this capacitor off. Make a note, the, uh, I think the negative is the other end of the actual fact. So we can just take the capacitor off here. Yeah, it's there. And it's there. Okay. So I've taken that out. And now I think, hopefully, I can actually see down there to get this thing back into place, okay? Kind of fits like that. I don't know if you can see clearly, but this transistor, the one, two, three legs have all lined up. And this one, the legs have all lined up. It's just these ones at this end and where the actual heat sink here goes into the board. I removed the capacitors from here, but I still couldn't see that on this side. So I've now unsoldered this thick wire that comes from the transformer so I can get a much better view of what's happening at this end. This device is like flopping around on the heat sink, so I just need to tighten that up. I think that's part of the problem. Okay, will it come tight? No, I'll probably try tightening the nut actually on this end. Okay, that's got a fairly solid now. Maybe just slightly out of line. Let's try again. These are obviously bent inwards. This one is definitely bent inwards. Okay. Guys, I still can't get the thing into place. Line this end up, there's not enough space. Um, I'm going to have to take the transformer off. I think that's the only way I'm going to get in at this to be able to do it. Yeah. It's just too difficult. But hopefully the transformer, the pins won't move. So shouldn't be too difficult. That's the theory. We have one winding here. Okay. And we have some windings on this side. Let's try it. I'm going to use the uh, desoldering tool this time. Might make it a little bit easier. While that's just warming up, I'll just add some leaded solder to this. Okay, so there are six pins here and two on this side. This is the uh, new handle for the solder sucker. What was causing the problem with this, by the way, them, and I did manage to break it, was using the cleaners. So we have these cleaning 
sticks that go down here basically to unclog it but I was finding it was jamming towards the end so I was getting the pliers and forcing this in and what actually happened is there's a metal tube inside here with the element around the outside and the metal tube pushed that way so it was sticking out into here a little bit which made it very difficult to get the glass tube off so when the little tube pushed further in the end of the metal tube was not inside the heating element anymore which would make it cooler and that's why it kept clogging up on the end so i could have bought the complete heating element with the metal tube inside for about 13 euros or i could buy a complete new handle for about 30 or just over so i bought a complete new handle and then i have lots of everything's new i have lots of spares off the other one but i probably will buy another heating element and fix that one and then we'll have to and we'll have a spare one so let's see if it's on solder <laughs> You can do this with braid, but I'd say it's easier to use this for this sort of thing. Okay. It's certainly sucking well, this new one. Slipped. I think the uh, hole's a little bit bigger, the Y's a bit bigger, this one. Okay. I'll have to do the same with this one. And look at that guys the transformer just fell out of the board yeah uh, that's the way to do it so just before we put this away we'll just give it a quick clean do not force a cleaning rod down one of these I've learnt that okay now let's see if we can fit our transistors yeah now I think I can see what's going on here, yeah, so I should be able to get these two to line up, in fact this one is lined up, it's just the one behind, it's a little bit more difficult, but at least I can see where the legs are going now, so I should be able to get this into here. And now I have it guys, so you can see the three legs there, you can see one, two, three here, then we have another device here, one, two, three. We have this one here, one, two, three, and we have the mounting posts here and here for the heatsink. So this is ready to solder back on. And then hopefully the transformer will be not difficult to replace or the capacitor. So let's uh, solder this one. So could I have got lucky and soldered this back on without taking a number of things off the board? Probably yeah, it's just the fact that I couldn't seem to get it to line up properly. And I just decided really it was quicker and easier to do that. We'll see how long it takes to replace the two parts out to remove. <laughs> Transforming capacitor. But it's all lined up. Without the transformer on, I can actually just use the soldering aid tool, a little stick thing, just to push the leads where I wanted them to go. And it went in. It's fine. Okay. Comments below, guys, what you think of that. Have I made life more difficult? Did I make life easier? Is life ever easy? <laughs> Should life be so hard? <laughs> A little bit of philosophy on the electronic, learning electronics repair, yeah. <laughs> okay. So that's back in, and now let's see if we can put the other parts back on again. 
Fitting the transformer back on doesn't seem to be a problem because the legs are very stiff, so they won't bend. So I'm pretty sure this will just go, yeah. They just literally fell into place. Yeah, you can see all the legs there. There are six on this side. Yep, coming through nicely. So that will go back on without a problem. And I don't think there's going to be a problem fit this wire back on either. Just solder this. Need three hands, of course. <laughs> Once I get one to hold it in place, then it's fine. Or two. That's it. Now I can solve it easily. Well, fairly easily. <laughs> You need a soldering iron, good chunky tip. You need to get quite a bit of heat into this sort of work. You will not be doing this with a fine soldering iron tip. Or unless you're better than me. Yeah, you know, I ain't the best. <laughs> so maybe you can. Get one on there. Put one on there. And now it's just a matter of sticking this stiff wire back down this hole and fitting the capacitor and we can get on to replacing the output devices. I've put the transistors back on the other heatsink. These don't need an insulating washer in here because effectively the transistor already has that insulating ring in there, yeah. But we can check, we can check. So we shouldn't have any connection between the actual collector and the heatsink. Hmm. Have a look. So collector uh, here, heat sink. Well, it goes to there. That's obviously that tab, yeah. And then from the tab to the heat sink, no. Tab to the heat sink, no. So they're okay. So we can fit this back on. This heat sink was much easier to fit. Actually, all the legs lined up. There's only three devices on it. You can see them coming through, that's the device that drives the standby power supply, the MOSFET, these are the transistors for the main supply, and we have the little leg of the heatsink coming through, there's one that actually is there, and the other one is here, okay, so th those two, so that mounts the heatsink, I think I can actually get us to balance, and we can get some solder on. Okay, we're getting there now. This is the little board that does the temperature sensing. I can see the wires have fell off the thermistor. That screws on here. And the connections to the thermistor are actually marked on here, so we can soon figure out where they go. Here, this component, B3, that's where the thermistor was. In fact, you can see the ends of the wires. So I just need to solder those back on. This we can screw back onto here. So the thermistor is connected up. There's no polarity you need to observe with these. Basically, it's just a resistor that changes value with temperature. We have the two large capacitors to fit, and we have the PFC board. And then we can test this. 
These things very rarely fail, to be quite honest. They're not worry at all capacitors. If they do fail, usually, effectively, all the gunge comes out the bottom end and rots the PCB. Eh, or rots one of the legs off completely. But, seeing as we're here, we may as well have a look. Uh, so, we can just go on the capacitance meter. We can also look at the SR, if you like. So, this one... <clears throat> The meter work. Oh, well. And there, what was I just saying? That's reading about eight hundred. And this one's reading open. Wow. That guy's is so unusual. Mm. It might look very slightly domes, but for one of these to fail and go open like that, it's like practically unheard of. Unless the legs have rotted off or something, yeah? Definitely, definitely faulty. Well, that's probably a good explanation of why the transistors failed, and that is really... I can't think I've ever seen one do that, to be quite honest. One of these type of capacitors. Out of interest, let's look at the ESR as well. So, these are not low ESR capacitors, as I mentioned. But it'd be interesting to see what they do actually read. That one's actually reading quite low. And this one is reading completely open circuit. So that is definitely duff. Problem is, I don't think I've got any capacitors of this value. I've got smaller, like 400s and 320s and stuff at 400 volts even, but 1,000 at 200 volts, I don't have. Can I even get some of these? I'm sure I probably could. Let's have a look. I've had a uh, look around on AliExpress, and the only ones I can actually find that are physically the right size and the right value are these ones. And you get four for 20 euros, plus a little bit of postage. So you're looking around about 22 euros. I mean, that would give me some spare ones and two to fit in here. I mean, one of the original ones is probably good but I would replace both of them so that appears to be the way to go with these um, it's a 700 watt power supply it looks like, like quite a beefy one so it probably is worth me repairing I'll probably find some use for it in one of my computers at some time so I think I probably will actually go ahead and order some but I have quite a lot of old power supplies and stuff around the place that are not necessarily faulty but they effectively scrap the ones i don't need so i'm going to be stripping a lot of stuff for spares over the next couple of weeks anyway i need to clear some space in the workshops so i'm just going to salvage stuff and throw things away that i don't want and maybe i'll find some although i think this is a bit of an unusual value in atx power supplies and it's probably only such a high capacity because this is a high wattage supply so I will fix this, guys, as much for any other reason as I'm sure a lot of you guys would like to see working now. Does that fix the problem? If it does, bear this in mind because this is something is not common. It's not something I would expect to find. I'm interested to hear what the rest of you guys say. Comments below. Yeah, that's a, a common fault because in my books, this is not a common fault. But I do believe that explains why the transistors blew up and we couldn't come up with any adequate explanation previously and now we can so i'm definitely adding this to my list of things to look for in future if i've got blown output devices or generally some other problem with the thing i'm going to check these capacitors now i'm going to make sure i check them because it's not difficult to do that in series in the circuit you may even be able to do them in circuit actually in fact, we, let's just try that. Let's just see whether we could have found this problem in circuit. I'll just solder them back in. Let's have a look then to see if we can actually see this in circuit. So, this is the good one. And it reads about 870, okay? And this is the bad one. And it reads very low. Yeah, like there's some other capacitors in there somewhere, but it definitely reads bad, even though it doesn't read exactly open. How about on the ESR meter? Okay, so good one. Let's have a look. 
reads very low here, so bad one. Reads open, okay. So there's your answer, guys. Yes, we can see it in circuit. We don't need to remove them to test them. And from now on, I'm going to be checking these things, that's for sure. I hope you guys learnt something there. I actually learnt something there. Well, at least, maybe this is a case of too much knowledge. Because I know these things don't fail, really. I don't tend to test them, unless I can see it all stuff leaked out of them. In this case, the only reason I removed them was so I could take the transistors off the heatsink in the first video. And, obviously, we know now I should have tested them, yeah? Otherwise, I'd have connected this thing back up. I probably wouldn't have blown anything up because I would have used the current limiter, but I'm sure it wouldn't have worked. Yeah, and depending on how it didn't work, it may have been rather difficult. I may have been scratching my head even to find out what was wrong with this. Okay, so there you go, guys. Not fixed yet. Get in there. I'll see you all soon on another Word Electronics Repair video. Ciao for now, guys.